All right, well, we'll get started. Um, what we're going to go over today is just finish up the last bit of uh, chapter six and then go right into seven and try to get as much of seven done as possible. So this is right at the end of six, uh, three or four more slides, um, really, to cover. So uh, what we want to do is think about stereoisomers when you have more than one stereo center. Uh, there's a couple of different kinds of things that happen, and uh, that's what I wanted to show you real quick. So uh, this is an alcohol, what is it, 2-chloroethabutanol, uh, 2-chlorobutanol. So if you look at, actually try to name this thing just real quickly, uh, there's a 1, 2, 3, 4, like that. And so this is 4-chloro, 2-butanol. But you notice that's a stereo center and that's a stereo center. So one of the ways people draw these, um, they'll draw them like I'm showing. Oh, uh, they'll draw them like I'm showing right here, and they'll um, they'll put them vertically like this, and the top and the bottom are going away, and the sides are coming forward, uh, and that's actually uh, known as a Fisher projection. And when Fisher, the guy who used this technique, did it, what he actually did was just drew lines like this. And he didn't do the hatches and wedges. He just assumed that you would assume that. Right. Not maybe the best assumption, but it works out pretty good. So, and, and what, what you do when you do this, this kind of drawing is you just, you know, you have your two stereo centers. Oh, shoot, I can't draw. I mean, besides I can't draw, I couldn't actually draw. There you go. Yeah, you have your two stereo centers, so you draw those as crosses in a fissure. Uh, I'm not gonna be doing fissures until we get all the way into uh, chapter like 16 or something. When we start talking about carbohydrates, we'll have six stereo centers. And that's when it becomes important that you just find an efficient way to do it. So that's what this is about. Uh, but Fisher is the guy who just who figured out the structures of all the sugars. And so he gets to be famous that way. All right, so, so when you have a stereo, uh, when you have enantiomers, right, how do you draw them? So let me give me a sort of brief summary. You yeah, you just change two groups, right? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was the brief summary I wanted. Uh, people are going like, well, first you draw, no, just, just change two groups. That's the brief summary. So if I wanted to draw this stereo, this stereo center and I wanted to, um, so to show the mirror image at this side, um, all I have to do is switch two groups, okay? But let's, let's try that. So on the next slide, all right, I made a whole bunch of blank ones. So here, here's, here's one of the structures that we're drawing, right? And then here I drew the other one. I left the CH3 at the same position. Traditionally, when people do stereo, uh, um, do, the, do the reflections, they just switch uh, the side groups and they leave the top group alone. You could switch the top group, but it's harder to see. So I'm gonna do this. I'm just gonna switch one of the stereo centers. So, you know, let's call this A. I forgot to do this. I should have thought about it when I looked at it. We're gonna do A, B, C, and D like this. And we'll see how far we get. So I'm gonna switch these to put OH here. And then over here, I'm gonna put H, All right? So that is switching two groups. So that center is a mirror image of this one here, okay? Now, if I wanted to do the other one, then I have to switch those two groups too, right? Now, I'm gonna put a CL here, and I'm gonna put the H here. And do you see how that's a mirror image of, they're mirror images of each other now when I switched both groups? So this is a pair of enantiomers. Okay, <clears throat> what you can do though is you don't have to switch both groups. You can just switch one and then it's not an enantiomer. It's a stereoisomer, but it's not a mirror image, okay? Remember, mirror images, if you have a mirror image, that's your enantiomer. So what I'm gonna do is switch the top group. So I'm gonna draw it like this again. And on the bottom, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna leave it alone like that. See that? So that's not a mirror image, right? The top is a mirror image, but the bottom is not. So this has a name, and, and both of these uh, 
this, this name will apply to both C and D relative to A and B. So I'll write that out in a second. But these are diastereomers. Diastere. Man, when I spell it slow, I can't spell it. It's weird. I have to shut my brain off to do that. I'm like, di, uh, this made me think of a really gross commercial. Anyways. <laughs> what? Too early? I know the commercial. Yeah. Oh my. Just, just made it come out in my brain. So I thought I'd drag y'all in with me. I didn't get your test graded, by the way. I went on a date, so. Yeah, that was a reason. My wife and I hadn't been out and done anything fun for a long time without the kids, and we took them to church last night, and then we just said, hey, let's go to Yoshino's. And yeah, that's what we did. So you didn't get your test. But I got a great meal out of it, I was just gonna say. <laughs> it was really good. Yeah, anyways, back on task. So that's the diastereomer. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw the mirror image of the diastereomer. So this is going to be a little weird. I'm going to, I'm going to do this again. And then I'm going to do this. Yeah, this is what I want to do. Yeah, I want to make sure I got this all right. Yeah. So, so these are enantiomers of each other. And these are enantiomers of each other. And then... They are, as sets, diastereomers of each other. So A and B are diastereomers of C and D. So A and B are enantiomers. And C and D are enantiomers. But these are diastereomers of each other. So A and B are diastereomers of C and D. So, so some of the things we talk about properties, like boiling points and all that kind of stuff, the enantiomers have exactly the same boiling points, melting points, viscosities, optical properties, okay? Except the optical property is the same but opposite, right? So they have that going, but the diastereomers are different compounds. They have completely different properties. So the way they melt, the way they boil, the way they, their viscosity is, all that stuff is different. All the index of refraction, there's lots of things that um, are different. If you're not familiar with index of refraction, do you guess what that is? When you look through water, you know how like if you look through water and it looks like like, oh, there's an object there, but you, when you go to grab it, it's actually not there, and it's actually off a little bit. That's because as light goes through, hits the surface of the water, it bends, just like it does when it goes through the surface of a prism. And that bending is caused by the index of refraction. It's a measure of how far the light will shift like that. So, yeah. Yeah, so enantiomers are exactly the same in all their properties except their opposite in, like, optical properties. And then... And, and then the diastereomers are completely different, okay? Okay, there we go. So, um, what do you think the relationship is between the number of stereocenters and the number of uh, stereoisomers? Right. So if you just sort of imagine what we just did is we had like this, we had two, right? How many did we end up with? Four, right? So two stereocenters gave me four stereoisomers. What does one give you? Two, right? And one gives you the two. So this is the isomers. Three will give you eight. Eight, two, four, eight, yeah, give you eight. Because every time you add a stereocenter, you double the number of possibilities. And so the formula generally is done as this to the n, where n is the number of stereocenters. Okay. 
and, and the rules are still the same. If all the centers are the opposite, they're mirror images, they're enantiomers, and if one of them is different, so if you had five centers and one was different, it would be a dysterium or it would have completely different properties. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, so two or more stereo centers. Another, another concept when you have two or more. This kind of looks exactly like the last one, right? Except for you, that there's no H instead of CL. <laughs> so my enantiomers, they look like this, right? Oops, sorry, go back. That looks like an enantiomer, right? And that looks like an enantiomer. So those look like, like my enantiomeric pairs, and there would be dysteriomers of each other. Uh, what's the problem with that? What do you guys recognize is the relationship between these two? Same molecule. So sometimes you take the mirror image of something and it ends up being the same, so it actually doesn't have a mirror image. That's different, it has a mirror image, of course, but yeah, not like a vampire. Oh look, it doesn't have a mirror image now. So, Vampires don't really exist, I hope. Anyways. <laughs> I don't sleep, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, so, these are known as meso. They have stereo centers, right? They have chiral carbons, but they don't have asymmetry. That's what this means. They don't have, if it has asymmetry, then it has a mirror image that's non-superimposable. But if it has symmetry, then it doesn't, it lacks that, that mirror image that's different, okay? So let me, let me put it like this. And, and this is how you can tell, actually, uh, whether or not it's meso, okay? Is you draw a line in the middle of the molecule or anywhere in the molecule, um, the one, opposite, one side is exactly the same as the other side. It's like the mirror image top and bottom. So you see here, when I drew the line in here, right, the top side and the bottom side are exactly the same. So that compound is meso. So any time you see that, that's what that would mean. So I'm just gonna draw a couple of random examples of what meso <laughs> might look like. Uh, let me make a blank slide, actually, it'll be easier. So I'm gonna draw, um, draw it like this. Okay, I want to make a good drawing so it actually looks like it. <laughs> this miso. Just drawing it. Ah, there we go. So I'm going to draw a cyclohexane, a ring. All right, and I'm going to put. Uh, I'm going to do this. Okay. So one, two, dichloro, dichlorocyclohexane. Um, and you'll notice that it has two stereo centers. That's an asymmetric center here, and this is an asymmetric center here, right? So technically, it could have four stereoisomers, but if you consider that, that, right, that's the, the mirror plane, you, you can look at that and say, you, that's meso, that means it doesn't have an enantiomer. If you try to draw its mirror image, it's the same molecule. It does have others, there are stereoisomers of this, but just to show this, I'm gonna draw its mirror image. And in this case, I'm gonna draw it like this. So if I'm drawing its mirror image, it's like this. And if I was better at drawing, it would look more like its mirror image, but all right, whatever. Right? That's its mirror image. But if I take this one and rotate it around 180 degrees, right, it'll be exactly the same. Okay, so that's what meso means, right? Um, see if there's another good example I can give you. Oh, you know what? Uh, let's do this. Uh, I'm gonna do it as a line drawing. like that. And then let's make these uh, bromines, because why not? I'll make this one iodine, 
because I don't ever use iodine. Okay, so this has got three stereos, three chiral centers. Like, remember, to be chiral, right? Like, like there has to be four things attached to this. There's a methyl, a hydrogen, a bromine, and the rest of the molecule. Um, oh, actually, you know what? Yeah, so I drew this a little bit too symmetric, but yeah. This one, right, it's the exact same thing. This one sits in the middle, right? It, and the plane of symmetry goes straight through there. So you know that it's meso. Now, I kind of screwed up because the left side and the right side are exactly the same. But, right. but that's the idea. You can have a, a plane of symmetry that falls in the, on an atom and goes through the atom. Okay. Okay. Questions? <clears throat> Uh, this is some examples of meso. Uh, it can get difficult to identify uh, when something is meso because, right, um, of the way they're drawn. And so if you really want to check to see if, like, number one and number two are the same, you actually, actually be, have to be able to rotate groups. Right. So, like, if you're looking at one, two, and three and trying to figure out if any of the same, what you'd end up having to do is switch the BR with the CH3 or take the H, that kind of thing, and switch it. Now this part's the same, and this part's different, right? So these actually are not, these are disteriomers. So these, these guys are enantiomers of each other, it turns out, and this guy is meso. Just a different example. Okay. So I want to go real quickly over stereochemistry reactions. I actually forgot. I need the model for this. I was thinking I didn't need it, but I want to make one. junk up here too. Junk I mean here. Yeah, more junk, works. junk makes it you know, sound so bad. <laughs> but since I've already said so many weird things today, it doesn't really matter. It's over by a town and country. You think, oh, this is a hole in the wall, right? It's really good. It's like been there for a billion years, it seems like. Oh, Sansei, sorry, Sansei. Oh, yeah, you've yeah, been to Sansei. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. of a place in Fresno. Yeah, Sansei. <laughs> that's where we went last night. But they have, you know, you don't forget. So I don't get out very often. Especially, I don't eat Japanese food very, very often because I just make it at home for the most part. Um, so, like, I skip on all the teriyaki stuff, whatever. But they make uh, mackerel. Have you ever had grilled mackerel? Man, it's good. Holy cow. I'm just going to say. Grilled right, powder mackerel. Well, it's, it is the holy cow of the ocean. How's that? Yeah, it's really good, though. I was going to say. Cow's really good, too. But yeah, I pass on all the karaoke stuff. We're going, I pass on all that stuff. Because that's all safe. You can actually just kind of make it home. My 1A class, I usually share recipes for, like, karaoke. Spam musubi, like the, what that is? The spam sushi? I can make that, so I never buy that. All right, almost there. I'm going to show you a mechanism using these giant models. Oh, uh, you know, I might as well add everything to this. I forgot I had to do this. Well, I don't have to do it. I just think it's easier to see it this way. Okay. 
carry a couple of bobs with me because I like to stand. It's not going to stay up here. Okay, here we go. Uh, so there's this. Okay. So so this is. Uh, well, anybody know what that is? Butane. Butene. Butene. It's got four carbons, but it's got double bond in the middle. So you see how it's flat like this? And these represent the pi bond. So there's a sigma bond, which I can't stick in there because the bonds aren't the right length. And then there's the pi bond. And this, uh, blue, um, well, blue is actually, uh, but we're going to, well, it's nitrogen, but let's pretend this is uh, HF or HBR. And, and we're doing an electrophilic addition reaction. That was just what you said, right? So here's my electrophile. That's this guy here. Because this is the bromine, this is the hydrogen, so this is uh, more electronegative, some positive charges here. And he comes like this, he goes, and he sits like this. Because he's attracted to this bond because there's electrons in here and he has a positive charge. So basically what happens is he sits here for a while and goes, wow, that looks really good. And then he goes, I think I will bond you. So, so actually, the electrons go like this. They pop out, and they hit this off, this guy. Okay, and they do that. And now I have my carbon cation, right? Now, when that happens, you see how right now it still looks tetrahedral, right? When that happens, though, there's only three groups, so it actually flattens out and becomes trigonal planar. So what I'm going to do is substitute that carbon center with the trigonal planar one, that's this guy here. So, so this guy, right, is gonna get replaced by a flat. And this is true of all these electrophilic addition reactions. So this weird bond here, that's the one I added. And now you see this is the carbon cation. It's flat. And, and this is the lone pair of electrons, right? And it wants to form a bond. So here's the thing. This thing's rotating around. This thing can come in like this. And how many different kinds of groups will you have when you do that? Well, no, I mean, just look at this carbon, right? We're talking about chirality. How many different groups are on that carbon? Four. Four, so it's a stereocyte. So these electrophilic addition reactions, when this nucleophile comes back in, it'll create a fourth group, and you get one of the stereoisomers out of this. Now, let's see if we can figure this out. That's the low priority group, so I'm going to stick that in the back, right? And so this is supposed to be tetrahedral. You know, I can make it kind of tetrahedral by holding like a hand cramp later. Uh, which is high priority is this one, right? I put four in the back because I can't. Now this is two, two, right? So this is one, two, three. This is R, okay? So here's the thing. You can also come from this side. Because the orbital, remember, this is now a P orbital and it goes, it's above and below. So now I can come in like this. What does that? You get this. And the four groups in the back. And this is one and this is two. Which way is one? It's S. It's S. So you get both stereoisomers. This way. Okay. Unless there's a reason why, okay, this is important. But, and it doesn't apply in this case, but unless there's a reason why this thing can't get to one side, then you always get both the game both of the enantiomers out. And so you have an R and you have an S and you get them in equal quantities. And so the solution doesn't actually have an optical rotation because half the molecules are saying to the light, you rotate it this way, and the other half is saying, you rotate it this way. Let's get used to that. <laughs> so that's the idea. So when, when you have this kind of reaction and the new Nucleophile and a carbon cation is formed. When the nucleophile comes in, it can add to either side and you get both stereoisomers. All right. Now that doesn't always happen. Right. 
Here's one instance of why it might not happen, because the molecule, when it's formed, has two groups that are the same and doesn't matter. But still, even in that instance, the chlorine came from one side or it came from the other side, but two groups are the same, so it doesn't matter. Okay. In this instance, right, this is essentially the one we just talked about, two butenes. Uh, let's see, I forgot what I have on the next slide. Yeah. I'm going to draw the mechanism out. So two butene goes like this. I get that. Right? And then over here, I'll have added the hydrogen on one. So I, uh, oh shoot, so I screwed that cut up a little bit. I added the hydrogen here. And I'm gonna have a positive charge here. So that's my carbocation, right? Now, if you think about this molecule, it actually has a hydrogen here. So I'm gonna leave that hydrogen here, there, okay? And that helps you visualize this trigonal planar because you have three groups on it. Positive charge, right? The chlorine can either come from the front, like this, right? Or it could go to the back. And when it does that, it produces a pair of stereoisomers, the enantiomers, just like I showed you it does over here, okay? Questions about that? Every electrophilic addition reaction does that, okay? Every, uh, well, to alkenes, every electrophilic reaction does that. So if you were to draw the products, right? You could draw it like this, where the where I do this, or you could draw it like this, where I do this. And the, the CL in the back means it came in from the back, and the CL in the front means it came in from the front. All right, assuming the plane of the, the, the screen or the paper that you're drawing on right now is the middle of the plane, right? This is a pair, pair of enantiomers. Um, we call these solutions uh, typically, uh, optically, we refer to them as being, um, what is the word we use? Racemic. How are you? I couldn't get meso out of my head. They also have another name. They call them race mates. I don't, you don't hear that too often, but they're called race mates. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, and sometimes when you react an alkene, you can get two stereoisomers out of it. So uh, it just depends on when you add it, whether or not, like the hyd hydrohalogenation reactions, whether or not there's a hydrogen on the first center. I think that's it for that chapter, right? Yeah, that's it for that chapter. Well, hey, next chapter. Good. Questions on the last chapter now? There's more reactions I want to cover, but they weren't there, so I just left it alone. Um, oh, yeah, I got to work over here. I'm like, how come I can't do anything over here? Yeah, it's one of those days. I gave you these, right? Slides? No? Yeah, I did. Hmm. Well, if I didn't give them to you, where are they? Did I just not pick them up? You know what I think we need right now is a five minute break. Yeah, five minutes, perfect. I'm gonna pause the recording. I think so chapter seven is all about what we call delocalization. Most, most of you in here uh, know that as resonance. And we're gonna look at how resonance affects stability. Um, and the, the, I mean, the general answer is, just to, before we get all caught up in the details, resonance or delocalization I'll abbreviate because I just ran out of room. Uh, makes uh, molecules 
or ions more stable. So that is the general idea. Of course, last time you drew resonance structures, I don't know, might have been a little bit ago. It's weird, I'm teaching this in Chem 1B right now too, so, so there's a t different take on it. And we're gonna look at how resonance, the delocalization, right? Uh, affects stability, how things will react. And the other, well, and the interesting thing about reactivity is uh, when we say that we have resonance structure, oh, sorry. Are you struggling with my, it's English. Mm -hmm. Makes molecules or ions, I could probably use all the letters that would help. It looks like Ian's. Makes ions more stable. Okay, so, um, you know how when we draw resonance structures and then we say, oh, the electrons are like in different places when we do resonance structures? It also means that when you do chemical reactions, you get different products. So if you can move electrons around, you can end up with different products. Okay, so that's what we'll talk about. All right. All right, we'll start with something um, that actually is not that important, but I wanted to go over drawing Lewis structures once uh, with carbonate. And so when you draw a Lewis structure for carbonate, you kind of want to have carbon in the middle. And I'm going to do this uh, in the sort of organic chemistry way. Puts carbon in the middle. I'm going to have to attach three oxygens to it, right? Like that. And then I'll draw the oxygens on it. Basically, I'm just drawing the skeleton like that. Now, how many bonds does carbon need to have? Four, right? So I'll do that. There's the four bonds. And then I'll just fill in all the lone pairs. So the lone pairs would be the oxygen with the double bond would have two lone pairs. And then this one would have like that. And this one would have like that. And then you'll recognize the oxygens with a single bond instead of the two bonds, right? That's Those would be minus. They had to pick up an extra electron to be stable. And that's one of the structures for carbonate. Why did I put the double bond on the bottom right? Because I felt like it. There's three ways to draw it. So we draw all three. And these are the resonance structures. So I'm gonna draw it to the bottom left. You can choose to do however you want. And I will include all the lone pairs for now. Just for happiness sake. That's a minus and that's a minus. And then my last one, I'll have the lone pairs at, or the double bond at the top. And technically, I should be, um, I should be putting brackets around these. I'll sort of do the whole thing at once, um, and indicating charge. Okay, so kind of like that. And because it's a minus two ion, you know, normally they put brackets around each one. I'm just put brackets around the whole thing like that. Because those are ions. If you don't put the brackets, I'm not gonna judge you based on that. Okay, so I can draw three resonance structures. Now, interesting thing, people study things like this, right? If you're looking at this structure, and you're looking at bond lengths, right? You remember double bonds are shorter than single bonds? So you look at this structure and you say, well, you know, this should be shorter. And this one should be longer. Because it's a double bond versus a single bond, right? And the charge is, this one is neutral. And this one is negative one, all right? Here's the thing, the bond lengths are all the same. And the charges are two thirds and they're all the same. Negative two thirds. Yeah, so, so where you expect a single bond, right? This is just some data. 
A C double bond, no single, a double bond is 122 picometers. That's the short, right? And this is 143 for the single bond. It's actually in between that. It's in between a double bond and a single bond length. Let's do this. I'm just drawing an arrow like between those guys. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to yeah. yeah I think I made too many slides okay um, oh actually I know what I'm doing. I want to do something real quick can I just freeze this for a second I can I think I just want to look at the notes that I put here. Yeah. Did it actually free? Oh, it actually worked with it. Yeah. I have like too many things here. Like I said, I'm rewriting all these. Yeah, I was looking at this slide. Okay, so, um, when you look at, de we talk about delocalized electrons, electron resonance, right? Uh, you often, you always often get more than one possible structure to draw, and each one of those structures is a resonance structure. An uh, and individual structure is known as a resonance contributor. So, and not all resonance contributors are of same value okay so like i tell my kids oh yeah you can go to camp this summer i'll pay this amount you pay that amount i'm usually the major contributor <laughs> i'm the one who like right donates the most to the overall chance of the kid going to camp the kid has to you know make some money and pay part of their way so we call those residents contributors now if you take all the contributors and you kind of average them together, that's known as the res resonance hybrid. And what's a hybrid? It's a cross, right, between two. So if you have two structures and then you try to put them together, that would be the hybrid. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you how that works with a carbonate here in a second. The other thing about uh, delocalized electrons and resonance structures is if it's an sp3 atom, okay, it doesn't contribute unless it has lone pairs. The only things involved in resonance are sp and sp2. So those things that have triple bonds or double bonds on them, those are the only things that contribute in resonance structures. Like a CH2 in the middle of a structure, right? That can't contribute because it's sp3 and it doesn't have a lone pair to contribute to resonance. So we'll do a lot of these structures. I put a lot, maybe too many slides, we'll see. Okay, so <clears throat> experimental bond length is 130, so that was between the values that I showed you before. How do I show a hybrid of this, right? This is the one of the slides I need to skip. Yeah. They, well, I don't really need to skip. I just kind of can say it. The average, the bond lengths are actually closer to the average bond length. Okay. Um, and the charges are like the average of the charges. So it spreads that charge out. Okay. So we can have three structures like this. And again, this is, we already did this on the earlier slides. So I think I can probably move this slide as I go on. And then that's what the hybrid looks like, okay? So let me go back one slide to show you how I put it together. So I have these three structures, right? And, and then in the structures, I have a double bond here, I have a double bond here, and I have a double bond here. And when you draw the hybrid, you just kind of mush it all together. It's not a true Lewis structure, so the electrons don't necessarily look all completely right. Um, but they'll look something like this. I'd put the carbon in the middle. I have oxygen on the same positions. You notice the sigma bond never changed. They're all bonded all the time, at least once. 
And then to show the hybrid, we dot, draw dotted lines like this. And that represents the idea that that pi bond, that double bond, is moving around between the three structures. Okay? The charge, let's just look at the top one. I have three resonance structures, right? Like that. And just looking at the top oxygen, how many times is it negative? Twice out of three, right? So it's a negative two-thirds. So these charges that are distributed here are negative two-thirds. And then overall, it's still a minus two charge. So you would still, like I was talking about earlier, you could put brackets around and put a minus two charge in there. So that's kind of what's shown here in the next slide. And that's the hybrid. Uh, they didn't draw the partial negative two-thirds charges on there, but they're there. Okay. Um, and the structure, if you look at the electrostatic potential maps, the ones they always show those in the book, right? It has a uniform negative charge all around the outside. And you notice how dark blue the central atom is? That's because it has three oxygens on it sucking the electron density out. Okay. And again, it's not a Lewis structure, but it, it, it depicts where the electrons are distributed on the structure. Another really important resonance structure uh, and an example to look at is benzene. Uh, and this is supposed to be, a, I don't know why this is even funny, right? Moments before his brilliant insight into the structure of benzene, it's a hexagonal beaker. Anyway. Yeah, there's all kinds of stories about this. Some people say that it was in a dream and he saw a snake chasing its tail. Some people say the dream was induced by like, because I think there was like a, thing with morphine or heroin at the time. You know, it was like a delusion. But anyways, he gets attributed with this idea that, because when they looked at the structure of benzene, you have this expectation, if you're looking at it like this one, right, that every other bond would be a different length. And that it wouldn't be actually like that, but if you were to draw it, it might look like this. This is what people were thinking at the time double bonds on the short ends, and so it would be like this asymmetric thing, but it turns out all the bonds are exactly the same length. Okay. And the way that we visualize these bonds moving is they all move simultaneously around a ring. And that's actually one of the special things about rings. All the bonds can move at one time. Every single one of these carbons is sp2. So if you're, again, going back to this other structure, this has a hydrogen on it, this is benzene. If I draw all the hydrogens on it, it looks like this. All right, every one of those carbons has three groups. So every one of them has a p orbital that it can use to hold a double bond. All right, so I can put the double bond either here or I can put it in between over here. Okay, so far, any questions about resonance? Have to have double bond, have to have a lone pair. It can be what we call delocalization, right? Ultimately, we want to look at how it makes things more stable, so we're going to be talking about that some more, too. All right. So, in order for um, a molecule to have resonance, okay, it has to be flat. So it turns out um, this molecule, this is cyclooctatetraene. You can Google it and get pictures of it if you want. But this is cyclooctatetraene. Okay. It has four double bonds in it. Now, when I hold up something that's sp2 hybridized, right, it looks like this. So it likes to have, what is this bond angle? 120. 120. It likes to have 120 degree bond angles. It turns out if you put four double bonds in here and each one of these wants to have a 120 degree bond angle, it creates a lot of angle strain. And what the molecule does is it bends. Okay? It puckers up, is what they say. So this side and this side both fold up, right? And when that happens, it's no longer flat. In order for a double bond to be created, a 
uh, like I have it here. Let's see if I can do this. I'm just shorten my molecule up. If I want to make a double bond here, for example, you notice where the double bond is, it makes the molecule flat. So if this is sp2 hybridized and this is sp2 hybridized, there's these p orbitals that are here that create the double bond that makes it has to be flat. If you try to rotate this, we talked about this before, if you try to rotate this, you have to break that pi bond in order to rotate it. Now, if you extend that idea like this, let's see if I have a couple more of these. They don't quite give you enough to do two double bonds, I think. They give you all these short ones. So I'll cheat. I'll do it like this. If you put it, if you do it like this, right, and you create another double bond here. It turns out these two can line up as well. And part of the delocalization is this double bond can switch over to this position here. So then if I have any delocalization, all of the atoms that are next to each other have to be in the same plane. They have to be flat, that's what that means, okay? So when we look at the cyclooctatetraene, this guy over here on the left, on paper it looks flat. And you think, oh, that can delocalize. But when you look at it like this, and you say, oh, it's bent, then that means those orbitals don't line up anymore and the electrons can't move around the structure, okay? So delocalization uh, requires that the molecule be flat. And when you measure the bond lengths, you actually have two different bond lengths in the structure. The double bonds are shorter than the single bonds, okay? For benzene, it looks like this. Right. It's flat. It's actually able to be flat. The, the bond angles in benzene are 120 degrees. And because it's flat, all these orbitals that are like this can line up. And the electrons just race around those orbitals. So when we draw the, the structures, one with the double bonds like this, and then the other one with the double bond like this, right? really what's happening is you know how I switched up with positions of double bonds. Really what's happening is the electrons are just moving. All, all six of those electrons are moving around these p orbitals. So it's like a ring, and it just goes around in a circle. For cyclooctatetraene, again, these are flat together, and then these are flat together. But because this orbital can't line up with this one, the electrons can't jump from here to here. Okay, so I think the uh, best thing for drawing resonance structure is lots of practice. So I'll give you a couple of rules. You only use pi electrons or lone pairs. Yeah, those are the only things you get to move. You don't get to change like atoms that are bonded to each other. That is not a resonance structure. That's constitutional isomer or isomers. And the overall charge doesn't change. So you have to keep track. Like if you have a charge and then you move electrons, you gotta keep track where that charge goes. And you can only move it between p orbitals. Now, there's a disclaimer to this. All right. And this is what I'm going to just make this little note. If a lone pair on an sp3 orbital can can, let's just say can, um, contribute to a p orbital, it will. In other words, it'll change its hybridization from sp3 to sp2 to make a double bond in a resonance structure. And the reason it does that is because when you draw resonance structures with it, it makes it more stable. If you can draw a resonance structure with it, it's more stable by drawing resonance. Okay. So let's just practice. Okay.
So which of the following molecules have resonance? And then we're going to show how the electrons can move as well. So which of the following have resonance? So does A? Answer is yes, right? And the reason it's yes is because this has a p orbital. That's sp2, right? And so the electrons can move like this. And when I do that, right, I'm going to get this structure. So, you know, actually, I'll get this structure. Didn't mean to do that. Let's see. Let's do I will get... I rotated where my methyl group was. I will get this structure like this. Okay. That would be its resonance structure. And the delocalization is it's moving that positive charge around. So there's half a positive charge in the, in the resonance hybrid, half a positive charge here, half a positive charge there. What about B? Does that have delocalization? So I'll ask you the question, this is the thing to remember, because it looks kind of the same, right? So I put it up there, it kind of looks the same. What's that? What's the hybridization of that carbon? SP4. SP3, yeah, four groups. Yeah, I know what you meant. SP3, right, so it has four groups on it. So it can't contribute because it doesn't have a pair of electrons that it can move around for the contributing to the, to the delocalization. So, so what happens is here, right, um, this is sp3 and the reason it's sp3 is it has these hydrogens on it so sometimes when you're trying to figure this out imagine that it has the other groups on it and then you'll say oh yeah yeah, I can't do that All right, so that's a CH2 group um, let's do D first so there's C's up there but D does that have a resonant structure Right, the, the primary answer everybody comes up with first is no. And then, of course, I did it for a reason. Draw the lone pairs in. All right. And if you have lone pairs there, you can go like this. Because this carbon that's here, this one in the middle, can, is sp2, right? Can accept another pair of electrons to make a double bond. Now, when I do that, my resonance structure is going to look like this. Now, let me see if I can do this a little bit, spaced out a little bit more. I'll just draw it without the arrow. It's a nitrogen, right? Double bonded to this carbon, like that. I'm going to draw the carbon out so it's like that. That's what it's doing. And then... The nitrogen has like that. So remember what I said, you have to keep track of charge, right? I had a positive charge. The total charge doesn't change. So where's the positive charge now? A nitrogen because it has four bonds and no lone pairs anymore. So this is positive here, right? By the way, one of the things that I want you to learn about uh, drawing these resonance structures, uh, if you can satisfy the octet rule, even though it puts a positive charge somewhere, that's way more stable than not satisfying the octet rule. So octet rule kind of rules on that. Okay. C. <laughs> now, now you're like, well, now what do I do? Right. Lone pair. And these are, this is, there's some patterns in here, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about what they are after we kind of look at them. Can I make a double bond here? Like in benzene, right, we just move stuff around and we could put a double bond here, but then we have to move these, right? It turns out you can move those. And one of the resonance contributors is when you do this. So I can't just leave it like that because it violates the octet rule. There's a hydrogen here. I can't have double bonds on both sides. So that means you move them to here. And then the lone pair ends up on the carbon. And 
And that double bond at the end is just to make you think about other things. That's all. It's not involved in resonance. And again, I put the lone pair on the carbon, right? I just moved them to sit there, so that has a negative charge. What am I missing? Yeah, again, on the nitrogen. And, and I, you know, I said the charge, overall charge doesn't change, so you have to take into account. If I get a minus somewhere, i got to have a plus. But it started out neutral. Now, of these two, like these are both, oh, I drew this weird line over here somehow. Of these two structures, so these two resonant structures here, which one would you think is more stable? Bottom one. Bottom one, because you didn't separate charges. When you take charges and you make those positives and negatives in the structure, what they automatically want to do is cancel each other out. And that's this bottom structure that's here. So when we talk about resonance contributors, right, this is the major contributor here. And this is my minor that's up here. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. That's the minor. But it, it, it gives us is it actually an important um, concept it gives us an idea where charges can go so if it's involved in a reaction you can get things happening at those different places <laughs> I looked in my water cup and I'm like what is all that down here and I forgot I dumped the contents of granola bar in here the other packages I dust dumped it in there so it's all sitting down there I'm like I thought it was something else uh, mold or something For E? D. D. Which is more stable. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so the, the, I have two structures for D, right? So this one didn't actually create another charge. It just moved it, right? That's one aspect. Second thing is it satisfied the octet rule. So the major resonance contributor for this one is this one because the octet rule is satisfied. And over here, this is missing. This is like it is over here. It's a hydrogen, right? Nothing else on it. There's not four bonds. So it needs to satisfy its octet and stabilize its valent shell. And so it, it, if the nitrogen donates, octet, this has an octet that's much more stable than just moving the charge around. And so this is my major and this is my minor. Oxygen on this, uh, on this structure, this is a uh, enol, right? It can contribute like this. Like that. And then, so the oxygen has to have a positive charge. Let's look at that ring structure. And what I did is, instead of drawing all the bonds and stuff, I just drew skeletons of all the structures. And we're gonna go through this process. Um, we're gonna use the same pattern, actually, that we used in this one in E, and that we used in um, C, and, and C. This is the lone pair pi bond pattern. It's push a lone pair and then move a pi bond and make another lone pair. So we're going to use this pattern. This is one of the common patterns you see in resonance structure. So what you see in C and E that are right above each other is one of these patterns. Oops, sorry. Yeah, I wish I could Let's be a way to do this. Well, wait, sorry. Thinking about software and how it works. So, uh, this nitrogen, right? I can push those. I can push this pair of electrons either left or right. It doesn't really matter. You just go one way or the other. Here's the thing, though. Once you start in a direction, just keep going in that direction. Otherwise, you'll get confused. There's actually, I think, five of them. I think I drew enough here. Five different resonance contributors. Okay. So, if I push the electrons like this. 
then using the pattern that I just established, right, the pi bond has to move and create a lone pair. Okay, so like this. So that means the nitrogen's double bonded now. Right? And then I have a pair of electrons here. And this nitrogen has a positive charge and the lone pair has a negative charge. And I haven't done anything with this one yet. So that one's unchanged. So when you do this lone pair pi bond pattern, it's always one at a time, okay? So this is one of my resonance contributors. And remember I started, I'm going counterclockwise for some reason, just because I started that way. So now I'm gonna continue in that direction. So I'm gonna take this pair of electrons that I have here, right? I'm gonna push those again. And so I end up with what? Another pattern. This is still here with a positive charge. That didn't change. So now I have a new double bond in here and a pair of electrons here, and that's where my negative charge is. So kind of like you think you're at this point, well, I just, this is what a lot of people do. They'll say, oh, I can cancel these out. I'm just going to put that there and we'll be good. What's wrong? The nitrogen, uh, the nitrogen has too many bonds, right? So you got to go around again. And so when you do that, you're going to end up with the lone pair there, the double bond on the other side of the nitrogen, and now we're like this, and a negative charge here, and the nitrogen still has a positive charge. And... You know, just keep going. I'm going to do another one. Okay. Did you get that one with the lone pair at the bottom now? And now I push it one more time. And what do I get? I'm back at the beginning, right? And this is what happens in, in most of these cyclic structures. They mostly give you um, a cyclic pattern that is you end up back where you started. Tastes gross too, by the way. I just had to try it. I was like, it's gonna be sweet, nutty. No, it just tastes like somebody spit up in my cup. Okay. Okay with that pattern, right? Another pattern. Oh, sorry. Uh, again, talking about, we already went over this. These are two resonance contributors for something that was very similar to what we had before. Which of those is the more stable contributor? The major? The left one. The left one, yeah, yeah. So this is my major. We talked about it already. This one's the minor. The minor because you separated charge. Separate or create. Hang on. One of these days my handwriting may really be like that, but if it doesn't have to be, I should probably not do it. So separate charges. Separate or create. Charge makes it unstable. Okay, so the major contributor is the one on the left that looks like a regular Lewis structure. Um, just to show you how the major contributor, um, go to the next slide. 
and the minor contributor um, like show in the overall electron distribution in the structure. Um, this is the this is the resonance contributors uh, for um, how do I want to say this for the anion where I removed a hydrogen from here of the of a structure similar to the last one. So if I draw resonance structures, these are roughly the same, right? These two structures are roughly the same. The reason this one is the major contributor, anybody know? Uh, well, they both do actually. They both have the octet rule satisfied. That's a good first thing to look at. But I saw was what I, I was like, is that the octet rule? No, it's not the octet rule. It's something else. So. Oxygen is bigger. Uh, not that it's bigger. Electronegative. More electronegative. Yeah. So because the oxygen is more electronegative, if you can distribute the charge, the negative charge to the oxygen, that's generally the, the major contributor, provided that you haven't created other charges in the process. If you look at the electron distribution on that structure, you'll notice that at the top up here, right, this is bright red of the R, remember it's Roy G. Bibb, and this one's sort of, sort of less red, even though in this structure it has a negative charge, and here it has a negative charge. This is what this is telling us is, you know, our prediction of the major contributor is correct. It's the one with the oxygen with the negative charge, so in the hybrid, this is gonna have more negative charge in the oxygen region. All right, so I think I should just stop there while I'm ahead.